All right. Hi, everyone. So I'd like to welcome you, welcome you all and uh, thank you for tuning in to tonight's um, installment of the SOMA Southampton Lecture Series. My name is Mike Dahl. I'm the Associate Director for Bivalve Restoration here at Stony Brook's School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, Dr. Chris Gobler is currently traveling and asked me to fill in for him uh, to uh, introduce tonight's speaker. But before I do that, I just wanna take care of a couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first, I want to remind everyone that Dr. Gobler's State of the Bays Address for 2022 will be held on April 6th at 7 p.m. Now, it's always an interesting and eye-opening event uh, for everyone concerned about Long Island's coastal environment, and I hope to see you all there. And I also just want to ask everyone if you have questions uh, during tonight's uh, lecture, if you can either put them in the chat box or save them to the end and uh, we'll try to get through all the, all the questions. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Bren Smith. Bren is the uh, co-founder and, uh, Bren is the uh, co-founder and co-executive director of GreenWave. He's the owner of the Thimble Island Oyster Farm and Brent is a pioneer in the development of regenerative ocean farming. So among his recognitions and awards, Brent was named one of Rolling Stone Magazine's 25 people shaping the future. Uh, that's why I call Brent a rock star in this field. And uh, he was featured in Time Magazine's Best Inventions of 2017. Brent is the winner of the Buckminster Fuller Award and the Kurt Bergfors Food Planet Prize and has been profiled by 60 Minutes. CNN, The New Yorker, Wall Street Journal, National Geographic, and more. He is an Ashoka Castanilla, an Echoing Green Climate Fellow, and James B. Award-winning author of Eat Like a Fish, My Adventures Farming the Ocean to Fight Climate Change. Uh, and I encourage everybody to read that book. It's so inspiring and um, really, has, really has inspired many of the students here at, at Stony Brook. So the organization that Brand co-founded, GreenWave, seeks to replicate and scale regenerative ocean farms to create jobs and protect the planet. They help train and support ocean, fire, ocean farmers in this era of climate change, working with coastal communities around the world to create a blue economy built and led by farmers. So Brennan and GreenWave has worked to train farmers literally around the world um, and uh, ocean, you know, new ocean farmers and I'm one of those people that have been inspired and, and, and uh, taught by Bren. When Dr. Gobler and I first wanted to start um, studying kelp on Long Island, the first thing we needed to do was figure out how to grow it. And you know, I'm proud to say um, I learned from one of the best in the field. So it's really my honor to, uh, to introduce Bren tonight. And um, uh, Bren, the stage is yours. Take it away. Thanks, Mike. The, uh... Um, uh, 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 the, I, just, I was just thinking about what it took to quote unquote train you and it was like the easiest thing ever I showed him like a couple knots and like pointed at the farm and then Mike figured it out himself um, the uh, but real real honor to be here thanks everybody and uh, you know just had such a deep great relationship with Dr. Gobler and Mike and Stony Brook and um, even now we're collaborating on a bunch of projects, but we have that muscle project going on right now, Mike looking at Kelpin and uh, muscles on, on my farm. So it's just been uh, amazing. And it's been amazing to see what Mike, since you sort of picked up this mantle, you and Dr. Gobler, what's happened in New York and Long Island. I mean, it's like the last, has it been four years? It's just been a whirlwind, a change and really, We've had very, over in Greenwave side of me, had very little to do with it. We just sort of like supported you and then it's really taken off. So that's, it's been a really amazing thing to, um, uh, uh, to watch. So what, what I'll do is, um, I really wanna get to question and answers uh, cause that's more fun. Um, and, but I'll tell a little bit about my story, sort of the cultural piece for folks that haven't heard it of sort of, you know, how does someone like me end up growing something like um, kelp? What's the journey there then talk about, bit about the farm, just give you a picture of what's going on in the water, why we think it matters, and then talk about Green Wave and the way we're trying to figure out how to, how to scale this industry and, and, and have, have an impact. So um, 
you know, I was born in my, my parents were from, from Brooklyn, but they were draft archers, went up to, to Newfoundland and had me up in Newfoundland, Canada. So I was born in a little fishing village, you know, the most Eastern point in all of North America, next to a fisherman's co-op, kids selling cod tongues door to door. It's sort of like, you know, the Brooklyn, Brooklyn foodies dream of an artisanal fishery. That was, that was, that was where we were, we were living. And um, all I ever wanted to be was a fisherman. And, um, you know, I asked myself why now, and I look back and it's like, well, you know, they'd go out in the morning and they had their own boats, no boss, self-directed life. They succeeded and failed on their own terms. And they had this pride of feeding the country. And I just, you know, feeding their community. And I didn't know it, but I was looking at one of these jobs that are so sacred in, in American society, which are like the people who power, build, and feed the country, the coal workers, the steel workers, the farmers, the fishermen. Like those are the jobs people write songs about. And those are the jobs like kids like me kicking around really want to do because they had meaning, right? Um, I, you know, the, the, um, I don't look at a Facebook book employee and get envious. I still look at fishermen watching them go out and I get envious every day. And I, so part of the climate change story here and transition is how do we keep those jobs around? How do we tap into that blue collar in, um, uh, innovation and really tap into people's sort of, sort of hearts and minds to get to put them to work every day solving the climate crisis? And there is something to fishing, the, like the nature of that job, which just really mobilizes uh, uh, sort of armies, of armies of folks. So um, at 14, I dropped out of high school and went to sea. Um, I fished out of Lynn. That's the first place I started as a lobsterman, but then uh, kicked around, did, uh, 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 you know, did cod up in Alaska crab. And um, by the time I was, what, like 18, 17, 18, I was just, you know, working at the height of an industrialized fishery. And, um, you know, we were just too good at fishing, right? I was working on big trawlers, big, um, and um, uh, most of the fish I was catching was going to McDonald's. And that human thing of just getting too good at what we did is, um, what have we just, we got too efficient. And at the same time, people started to look at fish differently, right? In Newfoundland, you got a saying, when the big fleets, big corporate global fleets showed up, it's like, oh, all these people, they want to turn fish into money, right? And what we're saying there, fish into money means, yeah, we want to make money from fish, but fish is so much more than that. It's culture, it's identity, it's, you know, it's beauty, it's a lifestyle, all this sort of stuff. And um, I think the, the, the globalization, the corporatization of the fishery in the 80s when I was there was really when fish became, we began to, uh, many of us began to experience it just as a commodity, I think. And, um, and that's kind of heartbreaking. Um, so. Uh, I was up in the Bering Sea, and then the, the, the fish stocks crashed back in Newfoundland, and that was the largest layoff in Canadian history. 30,000 people thrown out of work, all fishermen. And what that taught me was you could have an entire culture and economy wiped out by ecological collapse. Like, there are going to be no jobs on a dead ocean. Because I'm still to this day, I don't see myself as an environmentalist. Like, you know, I'm not going to think about birds and bees and bears that much. But... The ocean is a place where I work. It's where I get my identity. It's a kitchen table, um, uh, uh, a kitchen table issue. And, you know, many, many environmentalists who had been talking to me up at that point about overfishing and things. And I mean, it was all framed as a, as a, as a sort of classically environmental um, issue. And it just didn't, didn't resonate. But when I saw my culture destroyed, that's where it, um, uh, things really began to, to change for me. So I headed off to the agriculture farms and um, worked on the salmon farms. And um, that uh, was gonna be the great hope. That was gonna, that's what I was gonna spend my life doing. But unfortunately at that time in the, in the agriculture industry, it was extremely, it was sort of heading exactly in the wrong direction, pesticides, um, uh, antibiotics, you know, fish waste, all this sort of stuff, just destroying local waterways, really trying to build you know, Iowa pig farms at sea was really the model model there at, at, at that point. So I kept looking and I ended up down in Long Island Sound, right around this way, and um, uh, and discovered oysters, something that you all have been doing forever. And I knew nothing, nothing about them. And I started started oystering, and I was a terrible freaking oysterman. Like I killed millions of oysters. I just ran a death camp for the first couple of years. 
And it's just because I had no idea how to relate to the ocean as a place to grow things. I didn't know how to cultivate things. But over time, um, uh, Oyster had built, built a, a, a successful shop, was selling a lot into, you know, Brooklyn was the main, main scene. I was doing that for about seven years. And then Irene and Sandy hit. And we all, you know, this is no and nothing new to you all, but that wiped out my oyster business two two years in a row, and that was the moment where, um, uh, you know, this climate crisis that was supposed to arrive a hundred time a hundred years um, later had arrived right then, right? This was supposed to be a slow lobster boil, and instead it was a here and now issue. And this just reminded me so much of the ecological the the cod crash. In Newfoundland, where you have, um, uh, 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 where once again there were going to be no jobs on a dead, dead planet, so that's where um, sort of began to search around and rethink how what what's the relationship we can have to the to the to the ocean in the era of climate change, and oysters tell us a lot because um, as I as I began to look at other creatures um, like oysters, I found that there was this entire history, like alternative history of ocean agriculture that didn't grow around existing markets. So the trouble aquaculture, I think the mistake it made early on was it grew what people wanted to eat, right? So people wanna eat salmon and tuna, so let's grow salmon and tuna, but those are wild tastes, that's a wild palate. And um, um, instead we need to ask the question of the ocean, what does it make sense to grow? And then grow that, not around in markets, but actually grow what the ocean can provide and then shift markets. And if you ask the ocean what to grow, it says, why don't you grow things that don't swim away and you don't have to feed? And as soon as things, like you listen to the oyster in that way, and then you, you, you look back at history and there's this whole history of people growing regenerative, crops in the ocean that don't swim away, right? So you've got the clam walls in the Pacific Northwest by, uh, from indigenous communities like 3000 years ago. You've got a, you know, the first mussel farmer was an Irishman who was shipwrecked in France. He put up um, nets to, to capture birds and he got mussel sets on them. And, and then he became the, one of the first actual mussel farmers. Found out that on the 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 um, in San Diego and the docks of San Diego in the early 1900s, there were 1,500 workers processing over 30 different products out of kelp, and much of it was fertilizer and feed for 700 Midwest farms. Like there was this, so the, like we're here now talking about regenerative ocean agriculture, but there's a whole history that we're pulling from. It's just that it's time I think has really come. Um, because we're in this moment of, of climate crisis. So um, uh, so what I did is I just tried to figure out everything I could grow on my, my 20 acres. What are, what are the different kinds of crops? And had a ton of failures, a couple successes, and sort of still on that um, journey. So what I'll do is let me just show you a little bit about the farm. Where are we? Share screen. Okay. So this is a picture on the farm that a, um, a kid did for us, but it gives you a sense of, sense of it. You've got mussels, uh, I mean, uh, anchors down below, lines, ropes going up to the surface, uh, buoys along the surface, and then the, the um, uh, seaweeds and shellfish growing below that. It's sort of like an underwater scaffolding system. The key is with ocean farming is to be a willow, not an oak. Like you want your system to bend with the waves and wind and then pop and then uh, pop back up after the storm um, instead of trying to hold fast and and, and beat the weather. Um, there's the kelp that um, uh, you know we like kelp because it's a winter crop. It's post hurricane season, um, uh, and the, there's our mussels that's grown on the same lines as the kelp. It turns out once you harvest the kelp, you the little holdfasts are left over on the uh, the stipes are left over on the line, and that's where the mussels like to settle. So you get millions of mussels settle on, settle on your kelp lines, and then you can use those kelp lines to hang the mussel socks that you see there. We've got our oysters, um, our scallops. Here's a picture of the farm. This is the Thimble Islands in in Brantford, Long Island Sound. Here's a picture of the farm from the surface, um, and you. Over time, we've actually been able to reduce the amount of buoys, the impact. We've actually got the number of buoys down by about half from what you see now, just by changing the design, changing tensions. And this is so important because our oceans are these beautiful, pristine places, and we really need to 
keep them that way. These are the commons. These are places where we want people to swim and fish and come and as opposed to be um, uh, sort of blocked away from. And that low aesthetic impact is just so key so that we're sort of sharing the bounty of the ocean with, with our, uh, the folks along coastlines. The other thing is because we're using the entire water column, we can have a small footprint. I actually lease now, I have about 80 acres that I lease. I'm only farming intensively 20, farming less than I did when I farmed oysters, just uh, but growing more food because I'm able to uh, uh, use the entire water column. In a 10 acre area, you're looking at about 10 acres right there. You can grow with the new farm designs about 250,000 pounds in that, in that uh, 10 acres. That's the, that's the top yield of uh, first seaweed and a couple hundred thousand uh, shellfish. Um, so why we think this matters in the, like it matters because it's, this is a great way to spend the day, be on the boat. And uh, uh, it is a job that you can sing a song about, but it really matters in the era of climate change. And, and a couple of reasons why. One is that these aren't just sustainable crops, right? Sustainability is about, you know, lowering impact, right? And so they, these crops are great in that they don't require any fresh water, no fertilizer, no feed, but more importantly, they breathe life back into the ocean. So they're taking carbon and breathing back out oxygen. They're removing carbon, nitrogen, um, rebuilding reef systems. These are, we can actually farm our way into being sort of, sort of you know, workers that are in the ocean uh, as, 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 you know, as part of the, the, the climate solution and really uh, going to work every day, breathing life back into our seas rather than depleting it. Um, the other key is that it is applicable. I mean, you know, uh, Mike's, Mike's churning out farms as fast as you can. Uh, you see Mike invented basically shallow far, water farm, kelp farming in the, in the US. Um, and these things are really replicable. I mean, my farm, 20 acres, a boat and twenty thousand dollars, you can build a farm. If you're in deeper waters, it's a bit more expensive. But basically, everyday people can do this, and this allows for fast replication, which allows for scale. Right? The simplicity of design, the low overhead, allows us to be almost like the nail salon model of the sea, uh, low capital costs, um, and then it's scalable. Right? So the World Bank said if you take five less than five percent of U.S. waters, um, you could create the protein equivalent of three trillion cheeseburgers. Now, we don't know what the scale is going to <clears throat> look like and who we're, where we're going to go, but the key is we, when you're, when you're, when you are, this can't be sort of just a small as beautiful solution. This has to be something that can have a major impact in the air climate change, and we think it, it can. So um, founded, I think about six years ago, founded um, Green Wave, and the idea was there needed to be a knowledge network. There needed, I sort of, the decision was, do I build a large company around kelp and or do something else and i decided to, to do the nonprofit with uh, emily stengel and the reason was really needed um a sort of a, 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 a an entity without a financial interest that would foster collaboration and sharing um in the early stages of building this industry and so think of it as the hive mind like all the lessons that we're learning from farmers and others around the country bringing it back um and sharing that back um, uh, sharing that back out. And I think that's been really, really uh, important. Like at some point, Green Wave hopefully will not be needed anymore because there will be enough farmers, uh, enough processors, enough hatcheries out there. They'll be self-sufficient. But right now there needs to be this sort of sharing center. So our goal is to train 10,000 farmers uh, in the next 10 years. And that includes hatchery tags, processors, things like that. And we've got two pieces of programming. One is training and support. And the other is innovation. Um, the, the training and support uh, falls in two categories. One is this high touch intensive training. And this is what we work with Mike on, although he didn't need much, much help because he had so much capacity. But the, uh, you know, there we're helping people permit sites. We're doing hands-on training. We help set up farms, build hatcheries. Uh, we, we, uh, there's financial support. We help sell crops. At, and generally this comes with a social justice focus like yeah, you know, it, it's a lot of indigenous communities, it, um, fishermen directly affected by climate change. Um, this we cannot scale, but we could do two of these programs a year to really help uh, folks that are that that uh, need it need it most. Um, the problem was we started as that high touch program, and we were doing like eight farms a year, and then um, uh, we built up to eight a waiting list of eight thousand people just in the U.S. that wanted to. Um, sign up for Greenway programming and then requested 100 countries. So the question was, 
um, you know, what do we what do we do with that? And so about a year before COVID, we started building a, the regenerative ocean farming hub, which is open so source and really allows the solution to scale. Um, and it involves one, a training platform with like videos and curriculum, everything you need to get started um, uh, with your farm. It's got this, uh, tools like budgeting tools and farm design tools, and then a farmer community where you can share and learn with others. This will be going public in, on April 19th is the date that that's um, uh, rolling out. One of the uh, tools in there is, a is the farm design tool where you can put in your acres, your bottom type, um, uh, some of your water conditions, and it will spit out two different kinds of farm designs, an interactive budget, a gear list, and some permitting language. And this has been so important because we really need to normalize the types of farms that are going in the water so permitters know they work, um, uh, uh, and they've just been proven to grow kelp uh, uh, and other crops consistently. So these work with a whole bunch of different engineers and folks on, on these, and these all represent designs that have been out in the water for quite a while around, around the country. Um, the other part of the programming, so that's farmer training and support, and then there's innovation. And the innovation piece, because where are we gonna sell, shellfish is much easier, but where are we gonna sell all this, this kelp? And what we've developed over time is a whole leaf strategy, where you think of the whole leaf and, and each part of it goes to a different market. So you have um, uh, a food, so you know, I've got some with Thimble Island um, uh, mustard here, for example, you know, these boutique kind of cute products, but that's not high volume, but it's high price. Then um, ingredients, for example, to a cool, which is a New York company um, that does um, uh, kelp and mushroom burgers is I think a very, very uh, popular and successful. So a lot of the seaweed is going there now for the plant-based um, uh, uh, diets. We have um, like bioplastics, so making uh, uh, a packaging and straws out of seaweeds. So this is uh, Nopla and Lollyware, companies like that. It's the next section of the plant. And then um, agriculture, so the fertilizers, the feeds, the composts, um, taking all these different nutrients are in the ocean, collecting them with kelp and getting them onto, onto the soil and, um, in order to lower the impact of land based uh, agriculture. And between all of this, if you take the whole plant and you're able to get a dollar, dollar fifty for that whole plant for a farmer, you're able to make a, um, a really decent uh, living. So this isn't all making people, everybody eat kelp pickles, but rather really figuring out a, a no waste strategy right out of the gate. Um, well, part of the market development is the seaweed source. And this is where we're connecting buyers to sellers. So we're moving this year 250,000 pounds of kelp um, in New England um, and have forward contracts for all the farmers. Greenwave doesn't take any cut of this. We're just, you know, as a nonprofit, we're just coordinating. And that's just where, you know, think of it as, a, as an exchange. It's where uh, buyers and, and sellers um, meet. Buyers actually have to apply uh, when they come in in order to uh, gain access and talk directly um, to farmers. And we've just been asked to expand this out to Alaska and a couple other places. Then the other part of the market, and everybody thinks that this is environmental uh, blue carbon issues, but I think of it as market development, is the Kelp Climate Fund. And this is started with a pilot this year. And um, uh, we, um, uh, 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 and what it is, is farmers get paid 10 cents a pound for climate impact. That's, that's removing carbon, nitrogen, uh, reef restoration, all the good things that kelp does on their farms, they get paid 10 cents a pound and then they're still able to sell the kelp wherever they want. In return, they go out and collect some data on yields and quality, uh, which allows us to then, um, uh, you know, track it with a, with a, with a dashboard and really show, show impact. But this is right, you know, right now markets do not recognize the positive things that kelp does, like the, you know, the ecosystem services, the positive externalities um, are just not priced in there. There are a lot of efforts to do that with uh, carbon markets. Our trouble is carbon markets are too slow. Um, the policy is too slow. Um, and so we decided to create a fund. It's a quarter of a million dollar fund now just to directly pay uh, farmers for um, their ecosystem services. Actually, Dr. Goldler has a great program um, similar to this for nitrogen right in Long Island. And I think this is really the way to go to prime the pump for blue carbon. And then when policy and markets catch up, 
we can shut them down and they can take it over, but it's stunning how slow markets um, actually are and when they come together, how low those prices are. And we, we need to get kelp in the water right now and farmers get paid. Um, the last piece is in innovation and um, uh, you know, of the Greenway programming. And that generally what that looks like, we've got uh, reforestation projects and so we're working with the Nature Conservancy in California to build just to do reforestation up in Humboldt Bay with the kelp forests and to deal with, with urchin removal. Um, we do a lot of work on farm design and improving farm design. So last year, along with our uh, uh, colleagues at Hui and, and uh, Cliff Gowdy, who's an amazing engineer, increased yields by a factor of five per acre uh, with some new farm designs. And then the hatchery resilience uh, is just become so key. We can talk about this during Q and A, but the, um, we're really having trouble finding wild saurus tissue so getting seed out in the wild, it's happening later and later and the quality is lower and lower uh, and it's happening really, really fast. So I actually have a team in Europe right now visiting uh, some, some of the key hatcheries there um, uh, uh, in order to figure out how to store seed and keep it year round and not have to collect any wild um, source tissue. But this is probably, besides processing, this is probably the biggest challenge in our, in our industry. Um, so then I'll close just two more things. One is, you know, this scale question, especially in seaweed, I mean, there are people planting 40,000 hectare kelp monoculture farms off the coast of Africa right now. And um, the, 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 the problem in the climate space is that we're stuck between sort of small is beautiful, which are like these model farms on land or sea that we really want and we really appreciate at the farmer's market, but do not have a lot of impact versus big as necessary. The massive farms that do sequester a lot of carbon, feed a lot of people, it's like that. Um, and the climate space very often feels like you have to go big. And what we feel like is there needs to be something between small is beautiful and big is necessary. And that's replication, right? Can we, instead of having a thousand acre farm, can we have a hundred, 10 acre farms do network production that might be a little less efficient, understand it of like classic economic terms, but it be, might be way more efficient in that more communities benefit, it's more jobs, there's more justice, there's more political buy-in because people are benefiting. Um, so we really think the Green Wave Reef is the way to go, 25 to 50 farms in an area, seafood hub hatchery, and a ring of institutional entrepreneurs. What's been, and then you replicate those reefs. What's been really interesting is New York. Like, I don't know the whole story and um, I'm sure a lot of people on the phone do here and Mike does, but like, you know, you have Mike, Mike learns, starts to learn to farm, takes it on. Stony Brook builds the first hatchery. You've got the Moore Family Foundation and Cornell come into the um, mix to start farming. Um, you've got the Shinnecock Kelp uh, Growers Cooperative um, that take on and start start their own hatchery and, and start uh, growing along with a um, uh, the villa, which is a which is a uh, uh, I don't know like their, their sisters an amazing uh, amazing coalition there. And then I think we're looking at twelve sites in Long Island. They're now up and running. Mike, you'll have to correct me. And probably eight hatcheries next year. I mean, that's all in like a three year period, and that's a really amazing reef uh, development. I just want to situate like Green Wave had very little role in that like we just sort of did a little push of it it's all been really owned and now on you know you have the new york kelp bill comes out in the last three months you've got great companies like the montauk seaweed company trying to make you know doing the fertilizers beads things like that um and you really begin to see that ring of farms processors hatcheries and rings of entrepreneurs really happening right in new york and it's just been it's been stunning to watch it um happen organically from over on this part of the sun so um, I, you know, I will say, I think we see a lot of people coming to this sector, not because they love food, they don't do it, not because it's healthy, kelp is healthy. It's actually that they're really excited to try to build something beautiful, new and do food right out in the ocean. Like it's actually about building something we're proud of, like that protects the ocean commons, doesn't privatize seeds, has weaves justice into this economy, is polyculture, not monoculture. So all these things, that you feel like as an average person, you can get out in the water and participate and, and not be an Amazon or a Google, but actually be part of the new solutions economy. And then just part of the hope that we can really make something where we can all make a living um, out there on the water. 
And, and it's been really, you know, I'm neither a foodie, I'm not an environmentalist, but I feel very comfortable in the climate solutions tent because like that's work that's exciting and interesting, right? Trying to, trying to build something and take all those lessons from land and from other industries. And um, uh, uh, let's just, let's, you know, as sea level rises and there's more farmland for ocean farmers, let's just try to do it right this time. So that's it, thanks so much. Uh, I, I'll stop sharing. Mike, back to you. Thanks, Bren. And uh, I mean, I've I've seen you speak a number of a number of times, and uh, yeah, you you continue to amaze me and, and inspire. Um, and and you're very modest. You had a lot to do with what's going on in New York. So thank you, Bren. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. Before I do, I just want to again remind everybody. Um, the State of the Bays for 2022 is on April 6th at 7 p.m. I haven't seen Dr. Bowler's talk yet, um, but I can almost guarantee there's going to be something about kelp in it. So if you want to, if you want to see what's going on with kelp on Long Island, uh, tune in on April 6th for that for that uh, for that lecture. And uh, yeah, and everybody, please, um, if you want to ask a question, you can, I, I believe you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question, and, um, uh, or you can uh, put a question into the chat box. Um, but we are open for questions. Let's see. All right, Bren, I have one in the question, I have one in the uh, chat box so far here from, uh, from Margo and Lucas, uh, two, two of our undergraduates here at Stony Brook. Um, and they're wondering if you've seen an increase in natural sugar kelp populations outside of your farm. So is there, is there any natural recruitment going on? And if so, to what extent? Yeah. Um, um, uh, uh, I, I mean, I can't say scientifically, you know, we haven't done any studies on it. We haven't looked, all I can do is sort of observationally, like, you know, navigation buoys, all the gear, stuff like that. There's kelp, there's mussels, there's all sorts of stuff hanging, hanging off now that we, that we didn't see before. Um, um, uh, so I wouldn't publish that in a paper, but I can say as a farmer, uh, um, there's a lot going on. The other thing that's amazing is how many other creatures show up now, like the amount of ducks, seals, um, actually Jill, who's, our manager just sent me a picture. He said, huge, one of those, one of those gigantic shrimp, the manta ray shrimp or something, those massive things. Just pulled that out of a oyster cage. There's just so much activity um, generally on the farm. And I think that idea of overproduction, right? So, so seeding everything and under harvesting. So everything you seed is sending more seed out into the, um, out into the wild. You're rebuilding the ecosystem, but you're just harvesting what, um, what you need to make, make a living. I think it, um, that's that's really the way to go. But Mike, I think that's your next uh, next PhD or something is to go out and measure that. Um, let's see from from uh, Tanner Manin. Um, could you, uh, Brent? Could you elaborate a bit more on hatchery resilience? Yeah. So um, I finished seeding this year, uh, second week of January, right? Um, and I've been doing this for quite a while. I used to, um, you know, do October, November. And I think, um, and that's really bad because you want to be, you want the kelp to be in the water as long as possible. Like as soon as temperatures drop below 50, you want your kelp in gathering those nutrients. And the later in the year, the colder those waters, the um, uh, those less nutrients it, um, it's collecting and, and it really affects growth rates. So what's happening is, um, we go out and dive for wild saurus tissue. So you go out and you're checking, checking kelp out in the wild. You're looking for these browns, um, uh, like strips of reproductive kelp. You bring that back to your hatchery. You release those spores into your tanks and it attaches to string that, that then you take that string after a couple weeks and you get it out in the farm. Well, it's becoming so hard to find that saurus tissue and it's moving around like we can't there used to be down in Bridgeport we can't find any in Bridgeport it used to be you know like there were all these spots and so we have divers out like mad Mike you know this really well out trying to dive and find this stuff and when we do find it the quality is really bad now 
early in the season. So it's very contaminating. The trouble is when you take poor quality source tissue back to the hatchery, it introduces contamination to the system and there's a higher chance of hatchery loss. So what we're so the solution to this is what everyone all over the you go to any conference, everybody's talking about this gametophyte production. So get before so um, um, having the little critters year round and storing them, bulking them up so that you don't need to collect wild sorus tissue, right? Um, and um, uh, so I, yeah, I've got this team in, in, in Europe right now trying to uh, figure this out. And we need to be able to store seed year round so we don't have to depend on wild collection anymore. The trouble is, is gametophyte, everybody's talking about gametophyte work, but there are very, we're finding very few people actually have the blue thumb to do it. There are some tricks and things that like every, every university I know is trying it and everybody's sort of succeeding at the gardening level, but not the farming level. Um, and it's a huge challenge for the industry and it needs to be sort of solved. I was hoping this was a 10 year problem, but like it's a last year problem. Okay, Brenda, questions are piling up here. Let's see. And <laughs> there's some good ones too. So a, what, what edible products are available here? What edible kelp products can you uh, yeah. purchase right here? Sure. So um, uh, we have a CSF, you know, like community supported fishery, like a CSA. I'll tell you what, we, we have oysters and um, mussels and clams in it. But for kelp, we do, um, uh, uh, you, you, there's fresh baby leaf kelp is one. Another is bagels and schmear, all made out of kelp. They're kelp dog treats instead of salmon skins, um, actually made in Long Island uh, by uh, um, oh, who, who um, one of your really famous chefs out there. I'll remember before, but, um, and then um, kelp domo. So instead of grape leaves, use kelp leaves. Um, then we have the kelp uh, salsa, bread and butter pickles and mustard, like mustard Dijon, and then um, the Akua, kelp burgers um, uh, uh, people get every month. So there's like an assortment of things people get in their kelp boxes. Um, uh, the trouble with a lot of kelp things is right now, a lot of the boutique stuff is very expensive, right? Um, and, uh, but you, you can find that increasingly in a lot of like, you know, um, a lot of the uh, high, high end stores. Atlantic Sea Farm sells a great line of products. If you go on this site, it'll say where you can, where you can buy it. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Kurt Bretsch, a professor here at Stony Brook. Uh, Kurt? Great, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Bren, for visiting us at uh, SOMAS in SOMAS Southampton. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'll just start with, start with one, and then maybe if there's time at the end, I'll ask the others. So I think you started to answer this, but I'm wondering if your farms have been shown to increase local biodiversity either in the water column or in the sea floor beneath. Um, and maybe Mike can chime in here too. I'm not sure if anybody's looking at this, but I would expect that they would with all that great structured habitat in the water yeah. column. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton going on. There's things, we, we're pulling up weird stuff all the time. Seahorses, you know, like every, it's a constant haul, which is really good, but no one's, no one's gotten under there with like cameras and done counting and stuff like that. I think it's real. Um, it really makes sense. I mean, there's so much dense activity here. You know, it's like all cramped in. And because it's polyculture, um, I think the data is going to be really, um, really strong there. But there's just so many places to like eat and hide uh, there. There's just so much structure. And I do think it's very different than like one structure. You know, the fact that it's, you know, Mother Nature loves a lot going on at once, she seems to. And that's what, that's what they, these, uh, these farms do. So there's... Um, yeah, I mean, someone should definitely quantify it because I will say that like the science is really important. I'm no scientist and I struggle with scientists a lot, um, but it's been really important to show impact for social license, both in getting permits. Like it's amazing. There are 240 kelp permits in the country right now. That's a lot. Right? And there are none, you know, and everyone else is having huge trouble getting permits for fish and other stuff. Part of it's really the social license and the science. And then increasingly, folks being willing to pay us for ecosystem services, for blue carbon, nitrogen, for removal, really having the rigorous science behind that. And part of that is not just removal of carbon and nitrogen, but rebuilding reefs, because like all that fish is biomass with carbon in it that dies and goes down in the mud. Like that all has ecosystem 
be like a value itself too. So um, hurry up, <laughs> study. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, uh, Kurt, you know, I, I um, just anecdotal observations. Yes, we do see, um, we do see a lot of life around the kelp lines. And I'm, I, with oyster aquaculture, there is um, a lot of published studies on the habitat that creates um, and the biodiversity around oyster farms, a lot of recent literature on that too. But uh, I'm also not sure if there's really been, if anybody's really looked around kelp either. I haven't, I, I'm not sure. We haven't yet. Um, I know, uh, you know, we're all interested in it. Brad Peterson, I've talked to Brad Peterson about it. He's very interested in doing that. And um, uh, we were saying we have kelp lines under the Throgs Neck Bridge right now. And the, the folks at SUNY Maritime have a, have a little underwater ROV that we're going to, that we're going to use uh, this spring to go see what's under there. Apparently, there's a lot of striped bass over there too, so we're going to go look for striped bass with with that. And um, um, but anecdotal observations is yes, there's a lot of life around the around the kelp lines. Hey, um, Mike, that just that just reminds you of one little thing is we've been learning like we've been playing around. We've got a so far buoy and different sensors out in the farm and stuff like that. But we've actually found that kelp is the best sensor ever invented. Like we're able to tell so much from looking at it. Like if you've looked at kelp for 10 years, every year in a piece in a body of water, like you lift it up and it tells a story of nutrients, the coloration, the, like all it, it, sort of its thickness, the amount of biofouling, what creatures are on it. And so we're finding that taking pictures and analyzing the pictures are even more important than like water quality testing and like, testing turbidity and all this stuff, like it's all in the kelp. And if you can take pictures and have um, AI analyze those pictures, right? In order to track yield and, and biofiling and stuff like that, we think that's actually where a lot of the technology is really gonna help us as a farmer. So it's a bit tangential, but as like, as we've been trying to figure out what's going on the farm, it's been less like data collecting of numbers and images are really where it's powerful. And in, where we found in land-based farming, that's become true too. Like, tracking insect and pests and carbon yields and stuff are all done through images now uh, and analyzing images. And we're really, really heading that way. Uh, let me just say, if anybody is, is uh, you know, wants to ask a question in person and if you can't unmute yourself, I don't, I don't usually host these, so I'm not, I'm not a technology expert, but uh, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll keep looking and I can unmute people. But uh, we have some more in the, we have some more in the chat box. Um, and let me just scroll up because I missed a few. So I like this one. Um, and I'm actually wondering this myself too, Brent. Uh, why did you choose Long Island Sound to start your, your first oyster farm? And, uh, and why specifically there? Um, uh, um, well, like I fell in love and got dragged to a very difficult place for a Newfoundlander to get like the suburbs of Connecticut. And um, uh, it was literally the worst period of my life when I like, I fell in love, ended up in outside of New Haven in a town in Guilford and then had nothing to do. I actually tried to grow fish in a, in Walmart totes in my, I lived in an Airstream trailer for a decade in the woods, um, in the suburbs. And uh, I tried to grow fish and I was just so freaked. They all died. I was so depressed and I, um, had no idea what I was going to do. And then I found the um, Stony Creek, the Thimble Islands, which have a long history of oystering. And that was, that sort of saved me from, uh, I, 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 uh, I fell out of love back in and out like 15 times, but stayed, kept the farm the whole time. Let, 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 let's say that, but that's how I ended up down here. Um, I mean, there was a, it's interesting when you look at the farms everywhere, each farm has its pluses and minuses, of course, like the amazing thing about Long Island here is one, the Clean Water Act is probably the most successful piece of environmental legislation in history, right? It's just stunning what it, how, how the quality of the sound, but we're so close to robust markets, both the food economy, but also people like innovating, right? Doing weird stuff with kelp and doing oyster wine, you know, people are doing everything. And so I was able to build a business because I was so close to New York, um, uh, really, really why. So let's see. Don't move for love. <laughs> All right. So, Bren, um, what's what's your take on underwater mining, mm. and how detrimental uh, do you think it would be to Green Wave and the farms you work with? Yeah. 
I mean, you know, we're just in this really interesting moment. Like, listen, our, 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 like our food supplies being pushed out to the ocean, our wild fisheries can't handle that, right? So like, that's one thing. We need more food out of the ocean. Seas are rising. And right now, the, the strategy is to build seawalls or flee the coasts, right? There is a whole segment of, I think, um, uh, sort of capital, right? That really is looking to the ocean the same way we are as a place for solutions and opportunity. I think I define solutions and opportunity a little differently than, than many, than, than um, some of these folks. Um, but the ocean is, you know, it's like the Mars, Mars and the ocean. So like we're working with a team that we don't know if it's going to happen, but they've asked us to do the underwater food part of a floating city for 10,000 people for refugees. Now, some of these really kind of crazy speculative things, right? I don't know if it's happen, but like they're all thinking, okay, there's going to be millions and millions of refugees. We need going to, we're going to have more ocean. We need to float these cities and we got to feed people and figure it all out in this whole contained system. So like they've got billions of dollars of investors that are trying to figure um, that out. But, and so like, I can see that trajectory. The, I think the, the wind farm uh, is fascinating because um, a powerful, important climate solution. I saw the leases for the wind farms just went for $10,000 an acre, right? I paid, I paid $25 an acre. <laughs> like, you know, like what's that gonna look like? You know, are, or can we integrate those two? So we're farming in the wind farms or is this gonna be a place where we just harvest wind um, and then there's the mining, like what, what, um, uh, 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 and um, uh, again, which is like a, 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 you know, continuing down like a, a, not a regenerative path, but an extractive path. Like, can we build industries that yes, create resources and jobs, but actually address the climate crisis at the same time? I'm not sure underwater mining fits that. Wind farms do jobs. Um, uh, uh, hopefully justice and, and things. But um, I think that's all to say there is a race for the ocean right now. Um, it is not a place that's just like out that everybody looks at and is a place to be like a recreational space anymore. It's a place where folks are thinking that um, there's going to be continual crisis on land and we got to figure out new ways to relate to the ocean. And that's why it's so important right now that to engage in this sort of discussion about how are we going to protect our commons not through marine protected zones, right, of setting it aside, but how do we reimagine the marine protected zones as blue carbon zones where you have farmers farming, you have them doing reforestation on uh, areas, you've got artisanal fisheries, you've got ecotourism, and it all functions as something breathing life back into the ocean, creating jobs and feeding folks. Like, that's a marine protected zone of the future. Um, uh, but we really need to fight for those, those visions because the larger companies are moving uh, really, really, really fast on this. I just see it everywhere. So Bren, uh, let's see, from Tim first. So where can you farm kelp? Can this be done everywhere? And are there some regions uh, that you've seen that are more successful than others? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, kn I know Northern, I know cold waters. That's my thing. Like, you know, we have partners that are doing like our, you know, uh, different kinds of mosses down in Puerto Rico and stuff like that. The, there, there's, I, I um, you know, there are 10,000 or more ocean plants. We can probably grow something anywhere. The question is, I, I don't think as a gardener, it's like, and this is my challenge with a scientist very often. They're, they're like, think as gardeners, they can grow a little bit of it, therefore it's farmable. And I think like, how many pounds per foot do you get per acre to have a viable functioning farm that produces a lot of yield, right? And so the, there are a lot of species out there that we know how to garden, but don't know how to farm, right? You just, you, it's not commercially um, viable. Um, uh, 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 so there's, there's like, there's the different types of species, but then there's the question of sites just particularly for kelp. We find that, um, you know, some places just have low nutrient loads. So you'll get, instead of uh, uh, nine pounds per foot, you'll get, you'll get a pound or less per foot. And you can tell if you don't have a good place to grow kelp because your baby kelp will look really yellow and starved, right? That means it's not, not getting enough uh, uh, nutrients. We really encourage farmers to like, 
go get a line or two of kelp in the water and see what happens before you make any big plans. Because you listen, the ocean's going to let you do what it decides to do, right? You have no control over your soil. You can't build a hoop house. You can't fertilize. Can't do anything. You just got to like give it a try. And if the ocean's like, yeah, this is an okay place to grow, then you can build your plans around that. Um, so we do find uh, 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 farmers that we've worked with, they'll put in a site and there'll be really low nutrient levels in it and they won't get good growth rates. Um, it's pretty rare because I think there's too many nutrients in the ocean. <laughs> and that's probably, that's a positive for us. But Mike, have you had any trouble? Have you had some sites at really low growth rates? Well, funny you ask. Um, so I'm, I'm zooming in from the aquaculture conference in San Diego right now. And that's what I presented on yesterday. Or one of the things just around Long Island, this is just around Long Island. And um, uh, so long story short, in some of the deeper open water estuaries where there is less nutrient loading, we are seeing lower growth. And in the, in, uh, for instance, in the South Shore estuary where we have higher nutrient loading, we're seeing much higher growth. And um, it's the first season under the Throgs Neck Bridge in the East River, but the growth is off the charts right now over there. So these are, these are uh, um, you know, uh, just observations around here and some of them antidotal for now. We're gonna be doing more research on this moving forward, but I think two things, nutrient loading, right, is, is, has a big effect and getting the kelp out early is important. So this whole being able to control the life cycle and the gametophyte culturing and being able to seed lines, you know, not waiting for the natural populations because if you can get the kelp in earlier, they get that they get that early nitrogen boost, and we've set up a few studies looking at that. And uh, I mean, seriously, what a difference like three weeks makes from when yeah. you see when when you see the lines. And um, um, so yeah, so we're seeing that just right around Long Island. There's good spots and there's bad spots, and nutrient loading has a lot to do with it. But I also think the timing of when you get the lines out will will have a lot to do with it. Hundred percent. Yep. Yep. Um, Let's see, there's, got, there's a few more questions here. Let's see what we can get through. But uh, all right, I'm, I'm, re, I'm curious to hear your answer to this, Bren. So from, uh, from, from Ella Hartenberg, I was just wondering if kelp is such a sustainable and easy crop to farm, why haven't big corporations capitalized on it yet? Yeah, um, so, so they have begun Two, um, we have some of the biggest companies in the world moving into the space in different areas. And it's some in, in the processing space, some wanting, some beginning to lease, putting in applications for leases. Um, and um, so, so, so they, it's just started and you can just, you can watch the lease applications go in and who is it. And um, um, uh, uh, some huge multinational corporations are, are gonna do that. And I think what we're gonna begin to see, we're gonna see two trajectories and then it's up for society to choose, right? We're gonna find, we're, one trajectory is gonna be like natural solutions of massive monoculture, kelp farms, thousand acres owned by three guys who get all the benefits, right? They own the hatchery, the farm, the processing, the value added, the whole thing. It just looks like, you know, a regular large ag company, right? So that's that's sort of a 20th century model. They might be addressed, they might be helping on climate change, but what they're not doing is distributing benefits and addressing inequality and doing that other piece of the climate nexus, right? We needs to be and we need to we need to like draw down carbon while we lift up communities. And there's a whole bunch of re there are moral re reasons for it, but there's also just like political reasons. Like if people cannot see themselves in this new economy, in the solutions economy, they're gonna let it burn, right? Like if you want people like me to be part of some big environmental solutions climate push, right? I got to be able to see myself in it, and and that that is not me working for Mon Monsanto on a, some sort of neo-feudal kelp farm, right? Where they own the lease and I'm, I'm taking all the risks and stuff like that. It looks like I'm on my boat. It's not a robot. It's actually my boat. And I get, to, and uh, I'm, it's my farm and um, all that sort of pride and risk to it. It gives me agency. So I think we're gonna have like that version and then we're gonna have what, you know, a Greenway, but many other people are also thinking about something that really does jobs justice and retains culture as well. And I'm hoping if we can keep this hive mind, like there's incredible power in network production because the ocean is so dynamic. It's such a hard place to grow. 
that you need constant information flow from all these different people trying to grow underwater. Um, and so GreenWave just found that like swapping really fast, like, like just swapping information, trading information from farm to farm has been a, a really, really effective. So I'm hope, I don't know if it's idealistic, but I hope that gives us some, a bit of a, um, a uh, like a competitive advantage. The other thing is if we can keep these things really simple and cheap to farm, maybe, maybe, you know, there's a reason super cuts can't come in and wipe out all the local barber shops in my neighborhood. Right, I live in, in New Haven in the city here. It's because the barrier to entry is so low and the community like support for the barber shop. There are, I've got uh, nine barber shops in, in my uh, six block area, right? And, um, uh, uh, and it's because low capital costs, incredible community support, it's a strong customer base, stuff like that. Super cuts can't come in and, and wipe all those out. Maybe we can keep kelp farming cheap enough, easy enough barrier to entry that actually it's like not worth it for a huge company to come in. But I didn't know, I don't know what I'm talking about now. This is like, you know, smart people, economic stuff, but like we need to, we need to figure out something new because there's no way that I want to address climate change and live in the same economy we're living in now. Like I, I'm just not signing up for that. It's just not working. And I think there's enough people speaking about, <laughs> or where they might be speaking in different ways and ways that we don't understand it might be about, you know, talking about um, uh, COVID and vaccines and stuff, but a lot of it comes from like feeling deeply screwed by globalization, deeply alienated by technical, you know, by um, uh, automation and technocrats and things like that. And I, I think it's a really legitimate critique. And I really hope the climate movement is a big tent movement that um, regular folks can find themselves in. I think it's important. And that's the job of an environmentalist, I think, is to like, Create the right culture in your climate movement. So we have a hand raised from uh, Vikram and I will see if I can unmute you. Let's see, now you're unmuted Vikram if you wanna ask your question. All right, yeah. Um, so what factors have you like faced or do you think people will face um, that affect the production of the kelp? Say that again. What? Um, so, what are the factors that affect the production of the kelp? Mm -hmm. Like that, like you know, maybe destroy the kelp or, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we care a lot about um, sunlight. You know, underwater trees. So the amount of the sunlight that kelp is getting, the amount of nutrients, so the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, um, uh, carbon. We care a lot about um, salinity. Um, so that um, um, uh, there's not too much fresh water running in. And then we care a lot about temperature because um, um, of cold water species. And, and what we find is that um, like uh, uh, when, so we wanna find that sweet spot in the water column of enough nutrients, but then also enough sunlight. So it's growing. And then we wanna make sure it gets out of the water before too many other things start growing on it. So sea squirts, little skeleton shrimp, uh, 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 I don't know what they like, epiphyte, all this sort of stuff that Michael know all the names of. Um, you know, we just call it biofouling. Um, because as all that grows on it, like snails come and they chew holes, that all starts to happen after it, like 55 degrees heading up towards 60. So we wanna harvest that kelp before everybody else eats it. Um, or, or makes it really hard to clean because um, uh, uh, then, then we have to do sort of lower end markets like fertilizer and, and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Sure. I think you just answered another question in the box here of what is the season for harvesting? Um, yeah. But I think yeah. your answer is basically before it gets too warm. And uh, for around I here, that would be, I guess, what? June for you, right? And where you are? Yeah, well, like, here's the thing. A lot of people want to close up kelp permits, like the permitters around May 15th. And I actually push against that because like your kelp really starts growing when it has a lot of surface area. Like as soon as it gets to a certain size, it just then takes off. Like it just becomes exponential. So I get, I get a huge amount of my growth end of May, early June just before the biofouling sets in. And then I can, cause I'm in deep waters, 
I can drop my kelp down in colder waters to like store it to stay away from that biofouling, right? But I, I, um, uh, these are the sort of things that per like you think I, I love my permitters. They're doing such good work. They're really trying hard. What one of the things that they'll be like, okay, let's let's have a kelp permit end on May fifteenth because that's just before boating and and uh, uh, sea turtle migration and all that stuff happens. But when a third of your income comes in those final three weeks of the season, then it's the difference between a viable farm and a not. So like this is the granular granular nature of like of farming is and this the miscommunication between say regulators who really want to support this and make this happen, but the trade offs really affect us in a huge huge way. So I've spent time like negotiating the length of my permit and like showing my business plan and being like, listen, here's the difference if you give me till June fifteenth versus May fifteenth. Um, uh, uh, so, so this stuff really really matters. All right, I think we just have time for a couple more. Um, well, another question about products. Um, besides Atlantic Sea Farms, might we find, where might we find the, uh, you know, gourmet products and amazing products for sale? Um, yeah. You touched on that before, but if you had any other. Sure. So um, uh, uh, Barnacle Seafoods is a, they've got some great products. Um, uh, they're from out of Alaska. Um, they were actually bought out by an indigenous um, uh, uh, company. And um, uh, uh, you, they're up on uh, Patagonia Provisions, I think carries a bunch of their, their stuff. So Barnacle uh, is really great. And then um, uh, Blue Evolution has some really great uh, products. Uh, it's another one to look for. And then Akua definitely. Um, uh, other burgers in there coming out with a, like a line of five or six other um Crops. Then there's um, uh, that that the, then there are all these other uh, companies that are using um, uh, wild harvest, and they've got some great products. I, the the um, uh, I don't want to be like anti uh, 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 like um, uh, anti China or anything. One of the issues with kelp is that you have to just be very careful because it does soak up what's in the water, you wanna buy it from a place that has really strong environmental regulations, right? So it is worth, when you see a product, it is worth seeing where, where the kelp is actually um, grown, not where it's processed. They'll say like processed in the US, but it's actually where it's grown really matters because mo most of it's not inspected. You know, what 1.1% of seafood's inspected or something, some like ridiculously low, low, low amount. But those are some of the key companies. And then you'll, um, uh, but they keep pop. I think if I remember right, I'm going to make up this number, but I think there were like 62 newly formed seaweed companies in the U S last year. Like it's crazy how many are, are popping up. So, um, and then some of the kelp beer is really good. Some of the ghosts and stuff. I think you got some out, out towards you in New York too. Um, so, uh, let's see, we're going to go back to Kurt. Kurt. Yeah. So Brent, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, kelp beer because I the first time I heard you speak was on the um, How to Save a Planet podcast. And I know you've been on lots of podcasts, but that's the one that I listened to several times. And I put that in the chat for everybody to maybe connect to and listen to. One other thing that I heard in the podcast was about um, the many products that you can make from kelp. And one of them was um, about incorporating kelp into feed for cattle, which reduces methane, methane <laughs> dramatically. Yep. So as we're wrapping up these talk, this talk, I wonder if you could talk about cow farts, basically. Yeah. Um, have you made any progress in that? And are we seeing kelp? Are, are, are farmers actually incorporating to the feed for cattle? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, so there's two trajectories here. One is um, uh, there's a type of seaweed, asparagopsis, where they've got a lot of news, which is a type of uh, red seaweed that you, you, they gave it to sheep and then cows, and you get incredible, like 98% reduction in methane output of not the burps, not the farts, but the burps. Turns out a lot of methane comes out through burps. That's asparagopsis research. Now that when you do kelp, um, uh, they're finding big methane reduction in kelp with pigs and sheep. Um, and um, so uh, some of the, uh, there's some great companies like Ocean Rainforest and some others that are doing um, 
uh, 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 creating um, uh, like uh, 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 fermentations for animal feeds that break it break it down. And um, uh, uh, so, and I think, I mean, as much as we can take our inputs, because a lot of the animal feed is soy and all this different stuff, like that has really high impact. As much as we can grow our inputs in the ocean for our land-based food, it's a huge net pack. Benefit. I mean, I think we can probably have our biggest climate impact the fastest if we just started replacing as much as we can of ocean grown fertilizers and feed into our existing agricultural system. And it's not nuts. I mean, like, you know, people are using kelp fertilizer for thousands of years and, you know, deer in Long Island Sound come down and eat kelp whenever they're pregnant. Sheep have been eating it forever. Like there's just, it's something that's always been, it's been a finisher for for generations in, in um, so, um, uh, actually, I, I've had some eggs from chickens that are, uh, uh, you fed kelp and they're just delicious and amazing. Like, so this is something there's like, I've always wanted to try the Irish kelp, kelp potato, which I've only heard about that the Irish always grew this potato that they pack the seeds with kelp and it has a certain flavor that tastes oh. um, like a really unique uh, kelp flavor. So anyway, so there's like a whole, I, th I think it's a whole world that we can explore. I think the trouble is, the price points, like farmer, land-based farmers don't have much margin to pay extra for like a new feed or something else. You know what I mean? They're struggling in their own right. So making a feed that pays us well enough in the ocean and land-based car farmers can afford, I think is a challenge. But if you get into methane credits and things like that, then that can subsidize it and make it work. Thanks, Brent. Okay, I think this is a good, a good uh, question to, to end with. And this is from an undergraduate student here, um, uh, Asher Mann, and just wondering, um, uh, you know, what can somebody do to get involved? And is there internships and stuff like that? And, and Asher, let me just answer first, you know, um, uh, we try to get as many students involved as possible, you know, and it gets, it does get challenging. And the I have to say the student demand for this, to the interest, the student interest in this type of work is really, um, it's, it's really going through the roof and uh, which is great, great to see. And uh, um, I will personally try to get you out onto, an oyster, onto a kelp farm if um, to come see, but I, and uh, you know, for the faculty that are, that are on the call, I mean, maybe as a department, this is something we need to consider to, um, um, you know, some coordinated effort to try to get students more involved in this. Um, but, uh, but Brent, if you want to just take that of what can, what can people do to get involved in, and help? Sure. sure. Um, um, I mean, I actually think um, the, the ocean farming hub that's coming on April 19th is, is a pretty incredible resource in that first you'll like, you know, just from like seed all the way sale, you can go through, it's all free go through the whole curriculum, tons of videos. You get to sort of see it, like go through that whole process um, uh, uh, in order to find out really, really what's needed. And if, if this is something um, you want to do and then joining the, the community where it's just a mix of like hatchery technicians and farmers and entrepreneurs and stuff, all they're um, talking about um, seaweeds, seaweeds and kelp here in the US. I think that's a great place to listen and to meet people and to network. Um, so really look for that on August, uh, uh, I mean, on, on uh, April 19th. The, we, do, we, ha we have an internship uh, and mentorship program here at, here at Green Wave um, in the hatchery. We're about to do one for the farm as well. So uh, keep an eye out, um, uh, eye, eye out for that. The, the other thing is um, there are, I mean, we need all hands on deck. Like we need farmers, we need hatchery techs, need entrepreneurs, but need like policy people, economists, need chemists. Like this is such a new industry. There's so much we don't know, whether it's like from sensors all the way over to how to change the flavor profile to make this work that um, uh, uh, I, I just like, it's worth digging into. This is a fun space. It really is because there are so many unknowns and it's very achievable and approachable. Again, you don't have to be an Amazon to do it. Um, uh, so, um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I have a new daughter and I keep thinking what, what I want her to do in the future. All I want her to do is be in the solution space. Sort of that politics of yes. Like, what are we going to build? What are we going to do? Where, where are the solutions? Let's head there. And kelp is one of those. 
All right. Yeah, Brent, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you for all the great questions. This was, uh, this was fun. Yeah, this was awesome. So, um, uh, yeah, I guess good night, everybody. And, uh, Brent, thank you. Talk to you soon. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Total honor. Thanks, everybody. And, Mike, thanks so much. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Right.